So I'd like you to open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 22, reading the first 14 verses. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his own business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. And then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. We remember at least a couple of royal weddings, or at least most of us in this room. Some of us are old enough to remember back in 1981 when Prince Charles and Lady Diana were wed. But whether you remember that one or not, probably back in 2011, you remember the other royal wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton. Thinking about a royal wedding, if you received an invitation to go to such uh, an event as that, to not go would be absolutely unthinkable. You received an invitation to an exclusive event like that, and to decline and not attend, again, would be absolutely unthinkable. But here we have the story of a great wedding, a very important event, and the guests who were invited did not show up. And you know, just to understand a little bit of the background of the story that we just read, in Jewish culture, it's not like today when a wedding is set, and you know that on June the 12th at 1 o'clock you better be there because the wedding ceremony starts. It didn't quite work that way back in the Jewish culture. You might know that on June 12th there's going to be a wedding, and you've already responded to the invitation, you're going to be there, but you don't know the hour when it's going to take place. And so the custom would be, as we read in the story, the servants would go out. And maybe it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock or whatever, when the feast was ready and you had responded saying you were going to be a guest, when the servants came and said it's time to go, you went. And so you, you kind of lived that day in preparation. And so you were ready to drop whatever you were doing, and you were dressed and prepared to go, so that at that moment you went off to the great wedding celebration. As the story is told by Jesus, the unthinkable happened. There were those who had responded saying, we'll be there. We're planning to go. And so the servants are sent out, and the day comes, and they approach all these guests, and nah, I guess we don't want to go. Other things that we want to, we didn't really pay attention to the servants as they came saying, now's the time to come to the great celebration. And so the unthinkable happened in the story, but that's not the worst of it as we just read. Because there were others who did not just not pay attention, but became outright hostile to the servants. And they mistreated and even killed some of them. And as the story goes, of course, the word reaches the king and he's absolutely outraged and puts them to death and destroys their city. But you see, then there's a dilemma because there is the wedding banquet that's prepared. All the perishable food is there. The hot dishes are prepared. The cold dishes are there. Everything is ready for that, that moment. And so what to do? Those who had in, were invited have not come. And so now we've got a great lavish banquet and we've got to do something so as we read the story, the king sends out the servants and said, find anybody and everybody who will come in. 
and have them come in as my guest to this great sumptuous banquet. So no doubt those who had heard the, the second invitation and responded came, and it would make sense that they came dressed appropriately. But as you know, the focus is on one who got in who chose not to dress appropriately for the occasion. Looking again at verses 11 to 13. So the king came out. And you can just kind of picture this scene. Kind of overlooking the great banquet hall. The king came out and he's looked over the wedding guest. And everybody that's there, they seem to be appropriately dressed. All seems to be right. Except this one man. And apparently, whatever it is that he's wearing is not at all appropriate to wear to a great wedding celebration. Friend, how'd you come to get in without the right wedding clothes? Apparently, he makes no excuses. It says he's absolutely speechless. And so I guess he must have known what's coming because there's very stiff and stern retribution. And so he's thrown out and punished greatly. And the main point that's being made is that many are called but few are chosen. If you're called to the wedding celebration, you better dress appropriately for it. One thing I want to note about this story that Jesus tells, it is a celebration, first and foremost, a wedding celebration, the highest of all celebrations that we have in our society. And I think it's a fitting illustration of the kingdom of God because that's the point he's trying to make concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a great celebration, is it not? What an opportunity. The greatest of all opportunities and celebrations. And so it is a party. And I think it was Tony Campolo that wrote a book by that title, The Kingdom of God is a Party. And I agree with that. It is a celebration to end all celebrations. We pull out all the stops for that great celebration. The kingdom of God is an amazing, joyful time that no one wants to miss out on. Isaiah the prophet described it very well in Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. A great invitation to the great wedding. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. And you without money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. You get the idea of what he's talking about. The kingdom of God is a celebration. Choice food and wine represent joy and celebration. So the kingdom of God is a great celebration that we want to be part of. And you know, Jesus, when he walked the earth seem to describe and typify the celebration of the kingdom of God. He talked a great deal about the kingdom of God, but his lifestyle told us something about it. Namely, he had a habit of going to parties. That didn't always set well with the religious leaders. Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19, where he went to his house and had a celebration, had a great meal together with this repentant sinner. What about his first miracle? You know, we kind of like to dismiss that one, but you know, he really did what it sounds like he did. He took water and he turned it into alcoholic wine, okay? He turned it into the finest of wine for a great wedding celebration. And how interesting, the first miracle, the setting was again typifying the kingdom of God, a celebration. And he told the parable of the lost son. When he came back, dad threw a great party. Again, an illustration of the celebration of the kingdom of God. Again, many people got the point of what he was about. Others were very critical. Luke chapter 7, verse 34 is a very interesting verse. These are the words of Jesus. He says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So he kind of got a bad rap, didn't he? because he hung out with the wrong people and went to the wrong kinds of things. He enjoyed parties. But I think the point of enjoying the parties was to demonstrate that the kingdom of God is a great celebration. And you want to be part of this. You want to enjoy this great celebration. I was thinking about a wedding years ago in my first pastorate. A young couple in the church got married. We went to the reception afterwards. Great time, having a lot of fun. I'm sitting at the table with the wedding party. And I remember a commotion that kind of got everybody's attention, and I'm looking over that way, and I'm seeing this one table where they're taking, you know, those plastic wine glasses, 
And they'd gathered up a bunch of them, and they're stacking this great pyramid. And everybody's looking at them, and the, the part that got me was I realized that was a table of our church members. They're the ones that are acting up at this party. You know, and the first response is, this is a little embarrassing. I, no, it isn't. This is the image the church ought to present that in anticipation of the great celebration of the kingdom of God, that, that we're willing to celebrate now. That we've got a zest and a zeal now as we anticipate that which is to come. And you know, a, a lot of Christians don't get this. Because a lot of times Christians are, are stereotyped as the straight-faced people that never have any fun, right? And I, I came across a rather provocative statement that, that hits on that, and I think it's worth thinking about. The writer says, maybe if we, the church stopped shouting about what we are against and started throwing more parties and celebrating God and life and people and like Jesus were known as the friend of sinners instead of their enemies, more people would be interested in us and what we have to say. That kind of got my attention. And maybe that's right because typically in society, Christians are those that shout out what we are against and we have standards and principles, absolutely. But I think the point is well taken. If we convey that air of celebration that we're celebrating the pre-party now, as we get ready for the big party to come, people just might be drawn to that and drawn to what it is that we have to say. And I think about that and I am glad for what Lakeshore has become in recent times because I believe sincerely that our Sunday gatherings in recent times are a lot more like wedding celebrations than they ever used to be. And I enjoy the atmosphere that pervades when we come together because we delight to be together, we delight to welcome one another, and we delight to welcome those who maybe haven't been with us before because we're celebrating a taste of what is to come. And so I think it's good that we reflect that in the way that we conduct ourselves. Because after all, you know, we are headed to a wedding celebration. We want to be dressed up and ready for it, but Revelation 19, I just love these verses because this just precedes the return of Christ. And so this is really the wedding celebration that we're getting ready for. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9, describe something that I think we can scarcely begin to get our minds around. John says, I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean or the fine linen of the righteous acts of the saints. A great celebration. The great wedding celebration of the Lamb and the church, His bride. We are the bride. We're headed to the great celebration. And so we live in anticipation of the greatest of all celebrations. Right now we live in the invitation stage. The invitation, going back to the parable of Jesus, the invitations have been sent out. This is an age of invitation. And so everyone on planet Earth has an opportunity to receive that privileged invitation and to be able to respond to it RSVP, which I took a little bit of French back in high school. I think I can pronounce it correctly because RSVP stands for Repondez s'il vous plaît. Reply, please. Simply reply to the invitation that's been sent out. And so we live in that age. Invitations are sent out far and near. Everyone has the opportunity to receive it. But the thing that's important to note is that phase won't last forever. In fact, I personally believe we're coming to the end of the age of the invitation very quickly. So I believe it is a very limited time offer. We ought not mistake the fact that this period has lasted for a long time, that it will always go on. There will be a time when that's it. Every invitation needs to be responded to, every card needs to be sent into. But it is a privileged position and a time, and we need to know that. Acts chapter 13, verse 46. 
gives us an idea of the privileged time it is in terms of invitation. Because it says that Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. And they said, and they're saying this to their Jewish brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. That so well describes Jesus' parable. There were those who received the invitation first. They were the people of Israel. And so according to the parable of Jesus, they had uh, paid no attention to it. They had become abusive to the servants. They had refused the invitation. But you know, I for one am thankful for what happened with them because of the invitation given to me and to you. Because of them, the, the invitation now comes out to all people everywhere. So we have been given an invitation. And so we are very, very privileged to also be invited to this great wedding celebration. And just because we're the second ones to be invited, you know, let's not, let's not be insulted by that. Because it's still a great privilege. It's a tremendous privilege and an opportunity. And so we have been invited, and we ought to take advantage of the invitation and make sure that we dress properly for the occasion. And you know, that's really the whole point of Jesus' story. And I guess the whole point of standing before you today as I am, dress for the occasion. We've been given a precious invitation we want to respond to that, and I think most of us, maybe all of us, I hope in this room, have responded. If we have responded, the priority is to make sure to be dressed properly for the wedding celebration. So how do we do that? How do we properly dress for the great kingdom of God party? A lot of passages we could bring out, but I want to share this one in particular, Colossians 3. I want to give you a moment to turn there, because if you want to talk about what to put on, whether it's a tuxedo and a shirt and a bow tie and a cummerbund or whatever it is. There are certain things that we put on if we're going to go to the great celebration of the kingdom of God. So Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14. Paul says, so as those who have been chosen of God, pausing there for a moment, chosen of God because we responded to the invitation, those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, here's the wedding garments we put on. Put on a heart of compassion. Put on kindness. Put on humility, gentleness, patience. Bearing with one another. Forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity thought about coming out here without a jacket on a hot day like this, but I'm thinking this kind of represents, above all, put on love. Put on all those qualities, but top of the list, finally, put on love above everything else. So this is how we dress for the great kingdom of God party. Out of sheer gratitude that we've actually been invited to something this amazing, and uh, because we so much appreciate the invitation, it causes us to fall down humbly at the feet of the great king, doesn't it? So humility, first and foremost, is our response. We're, we're so thrilled to be invited that we know we don't deserve to be there, and so we fall down in humility. And the thing that we do beyond that, according to what Paul wrote in those verses, is because this is what the king wants us to put on, we gladly want to put on all those qualities that he wants us to have. We want to be dressed for the great celebration of the kingdom of God. There is a thought that back in the tradition of early weddings at the time when Jesus told this story, that it was a tradition that the individual who threw the great wedding celebration would also provide the garments for the guests to wear. Doing some research that, that likely was not the case, but I like the thought at least, whether that was a tradition or not, because in a very real sense, the king who throws the banquet that we are invited to does exactly that. We don't have to go out and buy an expensive dress or a tuxedo or whatever the case. The king who throws the banquet for us provides the garments that we put on. And what a tremendous thing. We are allowed the privilege of putting on the garments that will make us prepared for the celebration of the kingdom of God. I think of that in terms of the Holy Spirit. That's the great garment that we put on and put in. 
And so that's the power, that's the presence, that's the garment that allows us to be ready for the great celebration of the kingdom of God. So if we sincerely respond to the invitation given to us, our great host will supply us with the wedding garments. What a great thought to dwell on here this morning, that we have all been invited to a great wedding celebration, a royal wedding. Granted, we were not among those initially invited, but nevertheless, we've been invited on the second invitation, and it is still a gracious opportunity and privilege. And so because of that, we want to be dressed for the occasion. Again, the focus of the story that Jesus tells is that one man who came in who did not dress appropriately. And we ought to linger on that for just a little bit and consider these thoughts. Someone said that he came because he was invited, but he came only in appearance. The banquet was intended to honor the king's son, but this man meant nothing of the kind. He was willing to eat the good things set before him, but in his heart there was no love either for the king or his beloved son. I'm thinking that's a real stern warning that we ought to consider. So here's someone who was invited who came in but really didn't think that much of the invitation to want to honor the one who threw the great banquet, the father who threw the great banquet for his son, and not wanting to honor the son as well. We don't want to be like that man. We want to be prepared. We want to love the king, and I believe we do. We love the king who throws the banquet. We love his beloved son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, out of joy and gratitude, we want to come into the banquet. We want to enjoy the rich feast, but not just for itself. We want to honor, again, the one who throws it and the one for whom it is set up for. I'm thinking back at the royal weddings that I've known about in my lifetime in 1981 and 2011. If I had been invited, I am sure I would have wanted to, go, to have gone to it. Wouldn't any of us? If we had received a, an invitation to something like that, wouldn't we have wanted to go? Because that would be a high privilege. Again, the kingdom of God is a far higher privilege than that. It is the event to end all events. I, for one, am looking forward to it, and I believe that you are as well. I'm looking forward to the banquet, but I'm looking forward to the reason for the banquet, namely, to eyeball the sun, to be able to see Jesus Christ face to face. And I've been drawn back to that song that came out a few years ago by Mercy Me, I Can Only Imagine. And I was thinking again about the words. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall will I be able to speak at all I wonder that what will be my response on that day what will it be like to see Jesus face to face at that great wedding celebration. Will I have something to say? Will I be able to say anything at all? Will I stand before him? Will I fall down prostrate before him? I don't know. I can imagine it in my mind what I might do, but I'm sure what happens will be far different when that time comes. Again, I think about the invitation. The invitation is given. And I think about the privilege to respond to that great invitation and how limited the time is to RSVP. I feel a sense of urgency concerning anyone who has never responded to the greatest of all invitations. Make no mistake, there will be a time when the invitation will be withdrawn, when it'll be past time to send your card in, so to speak. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slow about His promise. Do not make a mistake in terms of the so-called slowness of God, as some count slowness, but He is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's what He wishes, but the day of the Lord will come. And so God does not want anyone to perish, but the fact is there will be those who will perish because they did not respond to the invitation while they had an opportunity. The great purpose of the church of Jesus Christ is to extend the great invitation to anyone and everyone and to help those who turn in their RSVP card, so to speak, to get ready, to put on the garments to be ready 
for the great wedding. Again, to receive an invitation is a tremendous privilege. But it's an absolute worthless invitation if we do not respond to it. By default, we've all received an invitation, but by default, if we have not done something deliberate in response to that, by default, we have declined the greatest invitation of all. And it's not the most terrific illustration, but if you rent a car and you decide to decline the insurance they so much want you to take out on that car rental, and they have you initial a little box so that you know how, how dire and serious this is that you've declined the invitation. They want you to know that. And, and, and so it is in terms of the invitation given to us. I, I wish there's a way we could say, you know, you got to initial this box saying, I am deliberately declining the invitation to be in the kingdom of God. I wish we could, with urgency, get that across to every individual we know that if you do not deliberately respond, you have declined it. And to decline it is the most horrible fate of all, to miss out on the greatest celebration of all time and to be destroyed utterly in judgment fire because God has to do that to those who haven't responded. We have an opportunity to respond and shall I say re-respond today. And I thought it appropriate to have some invitations here. And what I want us to do in a few moments, we're gonna have the worship team lead us in a closing song. But this is a priority for every person in this room, whether you have or haven't. If you have never responded, then I, I would really encourage you to pray and think about it and come forward and pick up this paper that says, His Majesty hereby requests the honor of having you present for the wedding. Simply, yes or no. Again, you've already checked the no box if you've not responded to it. So that's kind of been done for you. So really, in a sense, by doing this, you're, you're erasing no and checking yes. That's how it works. So anyone in this room who has never, ever responded to the invitation to come to the great wedding celebration and have Jesus Christ be your Savior to prepare you for that, this is what you need to do. But I thought it would be a good thing also for the rest of us in this room if we feel so led to reaffirm that. That yes, I did send in my RSVP card, but I'd like to go on record as doing it again. I want to verify and signify that I've done that and I still believe that's the thing to do. And so, again, that invitation is extended this morning. So these cards will be on the table up in front here. And uh, worship team, this might be a good time for you to come forward. But uh, what I'd like to also encourage is if you are making a first-time decision, please sign your name somewhere on this. And I would like to receive that back from you so we can talk and pray and, and, and get the garments on, get the, the wedding clothes on to get you ready for the great celebration. So that's what we challenge you to pray about and think about doing here this morning.